Hi, thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Furon. I'm the Director of Interventional Cardiology at Stanford University. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Rahul Sharma, who is the Director of Structural Interventions at Stanford. Uh, Rahul uh, not only specializes in transcatheter, aortic, and mitral valve procedures, but many other structural interventions. Uh, but today we'll focus on um, transcatheter, mitral, and tricuspid interventions. Thanks for joining us, Rahul. My pleasure. Um, so first, let's talk about mitral valve disease. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how common a problem it is and um, you know, what the issues are with mitral valve disease? Sure. So I think it's a much more common problem than most people realize. It's the second most common valve problem after aortic stenosis, which I think a lot of people have heard about and understand. Um, mitral valve disease predominantly um, is due to mitral regurgitation or leaking of the mitral valve, and then less commonly uh, mitral valve stenosis, which is narrowing of the mitral valve. So our focus um, in clinical practice tends to be more so on mitral regurgitation because it is simply a more common problem. Um, and there are many causes of why a mitral valve might be leaky or regurgitant. Uh, there might be a primary problem with the valve itself and the anatomy of the valve, and there are many causes of that. Or there might be a problem with the heart muscle itself that leads to uh, the, the heart muscle enlarging and, and stretching the valve, causing it to be leaky. Great. And traditionally, mitral valve regurgitation is treated with surgery. Uh, why do we need uh, transcatheter approaches? So I think surgery has, as you said, been the mainstay of treatment for a long time and the results have been excellent. But there are some patients who don't do so well in surgery and who are deemed to be high risk for surgery. And traditionally, either those patients underwent high risk procedures with less than satisfactory and ideal outcomes, or they simply had to rely on medications, which you know obviously was not as efficacious as, as a procedural intervention. So for those patients that are deemed to be at high or prohibitive risk for surgery due to multiple risk factors such as advanced age, frailty, um, impaired kidney function as examples, um, they're better off having a less invasive procedure or a minimally invasive procedure as an alternative to traditional surgery. Great. And so what is transcatheter mitral valve therapy? What, what is the most common type and, and what's commercially available right now? Sure. So transcatheter therapy refers to anything that's delivered through a catheter rather than a traditional open heart procedure. And what that means is that we can deliver devices or therapies uh, through a minimally invasive approach using smaller incisions in blood vessels. Um, some of these procedures uh, can be done under less sedation than full general anesthesia, and of course are much less invasive because they're going through smaller blood vessels. The more common procedures that are used at the moment are ones that people may be familiar with, uh, the mitral clip, which is a commercially available device, um, which involves passing a small clip device, which is placed on the mitral valve leaflets, and that's passed in through the, the femoral vein, the vein um, in the groin, and then a catheter and wires are, are passed up to the heart, crossed from the right side of the heart to the left side where the mitral valve sits, and then one or more clips can be deployed to try and reduce that leak and regurgitation. And of course, that's a much less invasive um, and onerous process than um, cutting someone's chest open to repair or replace the valve. Great, and which patients are currently eligible for the mitral clip procedure, and what should they expect as far as, you know, how long will they be in the hospital, how long is the procedure, that kind of thing? Sure, so like all devices, there's a, there's a natural progression, um, and so we've started with, based on clinical trials, treating patients who are at the moment deemed high or prohibitive risk for surgery. So anyone that is gonna be high risk for traditional open heart surgery is a candidate, uh, potentially for a mitral clip procedure, assuming their anatomy is suitable. Um, in terms of the patient expectation, it is still done under general anesthesia. We use a transesophageal ultrasound, which is an ultrasound placed down the food pipe to help us guide where we're placing the clips. Um, the procedure can take anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes up to a few hours, depending on the complexity, but on average, it takes one to two hours. Patients usually just spend one night in hospital and are home the next day. So the recovery is, is far faster and uh, much, much less of an impact on the patient. Great, and what have the data shown so far as far as the effectiveness of this procedure? Sure, so depending on the nature and, or the cause of the mitral regurgitation, where there's a primary abnormality with the mitral valve itself, uh, the data has shown that it's at least as effective as open heart surgery in those patients. Um, and then more recently in patients who have heart failure or there's something wrong with the muscle of the heart causing the valve to, to stretch um, and that's why it's leaking, that's also been shown to be as effective if not superior to surgery um, in, in certain clinical endpoints. And so that's very promising for these patients who don't 
won't have an option for surgery to know that they're receiving a treatment that has as good, if not better, um, clinical outcomes. And I gather compared to medical therapy, it's uh, superior. Absolutely, and, yeah. that, and that's what one of our most recent trials showed, is that it is in fact superior to, to medical therapy, which was the only hope for some of those patients that had heart failure and uh, a leaking mitral valve. Yeah, and so some patients, I understand the mitral clip may not be appropriate uh, as a transcatheter technique. Can you talk about some of the, the other devices or methods that you and others have been working on for mitral valve regurgitation? Sure, so the mitral clip is just one of the many transcatheter approaches that are available. Um, while it's most commonly used and known, there are other alternative approaches as well, where it involves taking a new valve and much like the transcatheter aortic valve space, actually implanting a new mitral valve within the patient's existing valve. Um, at the moment, there are a number of technologies out there trying to do that, and they're all in the realm of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. At Stanford, we are involved in two such trials with these devices, and that's an option for patients whose anatomy, as you mentioned, may not be suitable for a mitral clip. Um, and those procedures are currently done through a small incision in the chest wall, um, but we're very soon moving to be able to do those as well uh, through a vessel in the groin. Fantastic, that's very informative. Let's uh, switch now and talk about tricuspid valve disease. How big a problem is tricuspid regurgitation? So I think tricuspid regurgitation used to be known, or the tricuspid valve used to be known as the forgotten valve because it was often overlooked um, in favor of the seemingly more important aortic and mitral valves. What we've come to know is that tricuspid regurgitation or leaking of the tricuspid valve is actually far more prevalent than we previously thought and uh, far more serious a condition than we'd previously sort of, you know, given respect to. And so when you look at the numbers, just as an example in the United States, there's over one and a half million patients with significant tricuspid regurgitation, but yet only about 8,000 a year undergo an operation for that indication. So there's a big gap in, in treatment for those patients. Wow, definitely an unmet need. Absolutely. And so what are some of the transcatheter techniques that you're working on uh, to treat tricuspid regurgitation? So somewhat mirroring the mitral space, um, we are also involved right now in a trial to clip the tricuspid valve um, using, using dedicated clips that are designed for the tricuspid valve, which is often larger with larger leaflets than the mitral valve and requires uh, particular approaches and dedicated devices. Uh, similarly to the mitral space and the aortic space, there are also clinical trials looking at replacing the tricuspid valve through a transcatheter approach. So taking a new valve and implanting it within the patient's existing tricuspid valve. Uh, and again, the decision or the choice is based on the, the patient's um, other health issues as well as the anatomy of their valve. Great, and what are some of the early data showing as far as the effectiveness of these techniques? So a lot of the data that we have on these early trials which we're involved in comes from Europe um, and the data so far has been actually quite promising and the centers in the United States that have had more experience with this are showing very promising results as well, particularly with the replacement device for the tricuspid valve. Great, terrific. Well, Rahul, thank you for joining us literally from the cath lab between <laughs> cases, um, and thank you for joining us today.